Today's speaker is Micah Vera. He is the Avian Lab Manager with the University of Illinois. We are so excited today, Mike, for you to share with us your expertise um, today. So welcome, and I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Amy, and thanks everybody for attending today. Um, glad to be able to hear a talk, uh, to be here to be able to talk about uh, one of my passions uh, in our research here at the University of Illinois. So we're talking about the Northern Solomon Owl. Um, just as a brief introduction, though, um, as she mentioned, I'm avian lab manager and also field coordinator at University of Illinois. But a lot of people wonder, well, what does that really mean? Well, what it means is I help run a bird banding station near campus in early spring and fall. I help organize a study abroad trip in Yucatan in about two weeks. Uh, we maintain a network of 20, soon to be 35 MODIS towers in Illinois, 13 in Michigan, and then two actually in Oaxaca, uh, Oaxaca Mexico. Uh, we conduct surveys of breeding birds in Illinois, um, support whippoorwill and black crowned night heron projects for those of you that might be aware of those across the state. And then, of course, I conduct sawwood owl research and the associated public outreach nights that go with that. But we're here to talk about these guys and gals today. So without further ado, many of you may be familiar that there are several different species of owls in Illinois. Um, for those who are not familiar, these are the species that you'd be most likely to encounter in Illinois. On the far left, we've got barred owls. We've got short-eared owls that have just come down from um, Canada and other points north for the winter. Barn owls, screech owls, my personal favorite, uh, long-eared owls, great horned owls. And again, we oftentimes in Illinois are treated to a, a snowy owl um, or three or four every year in the winter. But of course, in the lineup, we're looking at this guy right here, which is a sawwit owl. So what makes sawwit owls so special? Sawwit owls are really a very small owl. Now that I've gotten away from that last slide, I went ahead and I put all the owls in a lineup actually to scale. And this tiny little guy down here in the red circle, that's our sawwit owl. So definitely low man on the totem pole when it comes to owls on the landscape in Illinois. Um, their diet consists primarily of mice and insects. Note that the mass of a sawwit owl is about 90 grams, while a mass of one of their favored prey, white-footed mice, is 30 grams. You can kind of see that comparison as this one's trying to fly and hop through the air. Um, you can only imagine, uh, for me, it'd be like trying to pick up 50-pound piece of food and carry it with me over a long distance. No small feat. So sawwit owls are cavity nesters. Uh, we don't typically see sawwit owls breeding in Illinois. They tend to breed much further north, as the next slide indicates. So this is a migratory owl. Unlike um, about two-thirds of the owls that I showed in the first slide with all the owls of Illinois, these owls actually do migrate. Um, many of the owls we're most familiar with in Illinois, like barred owls and um, great horned owls and screech owls, they're here all year. They're the, our local residents. So our sawwit owls are our guests right now. So they breed in northern forests between the Great Lakes and Canada. Um, and then they winter to points as far south as Alabama, Texas, Louisiana. Um, so we're only really seeing them in Illinois during uh, late fall, during the winter, and the early spring. The other interesting thing about sawwit owls, especially with regard to their migration, is that there's a difference in male and female migration. In fact, in central Illinois, 80% of the birds that we actually capture are female. Where are the males, many people ask. Uh, some people uh, would, would infer maybe that the, uh, the males are just too smart to, to get in the net, but that's not true either because we do catch males. The reality is more likely than not, the males are actually staying on their breeding territory throughout the winter, which would be a, a not a not a really pleasant uh, prospect, nice cold Canadian boreal winter. So many of you might be wondering, okay, well, I've seen some of these other owls you've mentioned, Mike, but why have I never seen or heard of a sawwit? Um, well, as I mentioned earlier, these are part-time residents in Illinois. Um, they come down to Illinois when, it, when for them it's warm. I don't know most people, when they walk outside on a day like today, if they consider it warm. But for a sawwit owl, this is warm. Um, 
they also do not typically vocalize during this time that they're in Illinois. So that makes it pretty difficult to uh, detect them. Many bird watchers rely on their hearing to, to detect birds that are often difficult to, to see. So we don't have that cue to rely on. And then also these owls are often found in really dense understory vegetation. We're talking about the favorites of like bush honeysuckle and autumn olive and and uh, red cedar, wild grapevine, multiflora rose, all the really fun stuff to hike and crawl through. Um, so the interesting thing about this is oftentimes they could be on the landscape and we just really wouldn't see them. And for those of you wondering why on earth I have the pictures on this slide that I do, uh, this is kind of a phenomenon that was brought to light three years ago in New York City in 2020, a year many of us remember well. Um, so you'll notice the uh, Christmas tree there. I think that's a Norway spruce that they had taken from upstate New York. They cut it down to take it to Rockefeller Center, and they go to put the tree up and come to find out after driving, uh, I think it was like uh, for three days transporting this tree down to uh, New York City, there was actually a saw wet owl in the tree, uh, which was a little bit uh, of a rough ride, I imagine, for that owl, um, although it got a good uh, tour of New York along the way, I'm sure. Um, and of course, it was because it had been three days since it probably had had any water or food. They they took it to a wildlife rehabilitation center, but they named uh, they named the the owl Rocky, the sawwet owl for Rockefeller Center, and and now it's this phenomenon. For the left, they have a mascot now called Roxy, a little bit different from Rocky, and uh, it's a whole phenomenon. But the reality is, these owls they are very difficult to detect, um, and so it's very possible that there's. There's a saw wet owl somewhere in the county that you live in Illinois, you just never realized it. And just to really reinforce how difficult it can be to find a saw wet owl. I mean, everybody can see the owl in this picture, right? <laughs> of course, it's right there, okay? <laughs> so, um, this, and, and mind you, this bird, I was kind of cheating. I actually had a transmitter on this bird. I can't tell you how long though, even though I had a receiver to tell me that there was a bird there, I can't tell you how long I looked uh, before I finally saw that owl. I'm pretty sure I was actually standing right underneath it without realizing. So they are very secretive. And I, to say it kind of makes sense that they would be secretive as well, because if you think about the size of this owl and it's just sitting there during the day, there's any number of predators that would love to eat it as a snack. So it is very important that they have this cryptic plumage that allows them to blend in and also that they sit still and they don't make any noise. That's their survival strategy. So with regard to current knowledge on sawwits, because as you can't, as you might imagine, because they're, they are so difficult to detect, so difficult to locate out, uh, sawwit owls, our information in, uh, about sawwit owls is pretty limited. Um, one major breakthrough came about 20 or 30 years ago when it was determined that you could actually lure saw wet owls into a net and thereby catch more, detect them on the landscape, um, of course, with the proper permissions from the Bird Banding Lab in Washington, D.C. So many people banned saw wet owls as a result of that discovery, um, but uh, we don't really have a whole lot of other movement information if all you do is capture the bird, put a metal band on its leg and release it. The only way you'd have any information about that bird is if you recaptured it. Now, one thing I will say is that these birds actually have a 35% recapture rate, which is really big in the bird world. Um, and, and I've actually recaptured birds that other people have caught uh, and banded. But the thing I wanna point out in the map down here is these birds are all over the place. So this. These red uh, paths are actually the paths that, uh, or I should say straight line path between uh, where this bird was banded originally and then where it was caught later, which might be a little unusual because we don't typically think of birds going east to west across the United States and at the same time at another point in the year going north and south. So something odd is going on here. Um, this is just to show what it typically looks like when you get, uh, and this is for any bird actually that you would um, encounter, whether it was a live bird or a dead bird, if it had been banded by someone else, you can actually submit that uh, data, the band number, to the bird banding lab, which is part of the USGS. And then it'll give you, they'll send you a certificate 
thanking you for your participation. And then they'll provide information about where this bird was originally banded. So this bird I actually caught at Kennecook uh, County Park, which is near uh, Danville, Illinois. And uh, this bird originally was, uh, was caught and banded in Whitefish Point up uh, on the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And so it gives you an idea of when it was banded, how old it is, all that sort of information, which is important, especially when we look at oftentimes questions I get are, well, how long can this bird live in the wild? The only thing that we have to go off of is if somebody was able to recapture or encounter this bird again after it was initially abandoned. Regarding our current knowledge, we also know that these owls do produce noises. Uh, the most common noise or call associated with this particular uh, owl is a toot, which sounds like this. Hopefully my sound works. So that's the territorial call that the male produces on his uh, breeding grounds up in Canada. Um, they also produce what we call an agitated whine. But these birds are rarely vocalizing on wintering grounds. And when they are, they're not tooting. They're using one of these other two calls. So we know what we know from uh, Project Alnut. And what Project Alnut is, is a collaboration of over 100 banding stations across the United States and Canada. And what this provides is a protocol or a, a basic plan for capturing and banding saw wet owls across uh, the two countries. And of course, um, it is important that you are permitted with the, um, with the bird banding lab in Washington, DC in order to participate. And uh, what this has allowed over the years is the opportunity to work toward common research questions. And as a result, larger data sets, which help us answer some of these big questions we have about saw wet owls. This just shows a uh, distribution of the Project Alnet uh, locations across the range. Um, I had to make this map big just because we do have one all the way out here in Alaska, way at the limits of uh, the Saw Wet Owl range. Um, of course, the two banding stations I work at are here in central Illinois between Danville and um, Monticello. So regarding our research, you know, what are we interested in researching? We have some basic questions that we're trying to get some answers to. Um, one thing we're looking at is what factors might impact the activity patterns of saw wet owls during stopover and winter? We're really kind of limited. We do have all these banding stations that do run for a short period of time and they capture owls, but are they catching more owls at one point in the year because just the owls are more active? Or is it just some other um, reason that they might be catching these owls? Uh, maybe it's just the position of the net and they keep catching the same owl over and over again. Um, or maybe it just has to do with the location of the net um, or the weather that particular evening. We're also looking at what response saw wet owls have to conspecific vocalizations in winter. So in other words, if I play that two call, are all owls actually coming to the call or if I use one of those different calls, unfortunately you weren't able to hear, I'll see if I can't play it a little bit later. Um, you know, are those, are those uh, having the same impact um, or is it just this territorial toot call? Um, this whole territorial toot call is really kind of an odd thing because um, why would birds on their wintering grounds be responding to a territorial call? Uh, we know of course that uh, males would be territorial on their breeding grounds because they want to protect the food resources in the area and they want to attract and protect their mates. But if there's not many males down here on their wintering grounds and there's, you know, um, and they're not breeding, why, why would there be any reaction? Um, and then finally, looking at migratory connectivity. I mean, many of us think that, you know, most birds should be going north and south in migration. And for the most part, most bird species do. If you're looking at you know, Arctic terns, or you're looking at um, even Canada geese and, and many other uh, taxa of birds, 
they're just migrating in a more or less straight line south or wherever the um, southeast, southwest, uh, wherever their uh, wintering ground is. They're not doing any of these forays off to the east and the west. So what might be going on here? So how do we study this? Um, I get this question a lot. Um, so we tag Sawat owls using the Project Owlnet protocols I mentioned earlier. Our bending efforts typically begin in mid-October through December. That's when I switch into nocturnal mode as the, as the leaves start to fall, and we start to get some brisk weather, and we start to, um, and it starts to get darker and darker earlier and earlier. Um, so what we do is we work at three locations, Kennecook County Park, Allerton Park, and then also Homer Lake Park near Champaign. And at each site, we have five arrays of three mist nets with territorial callback equipment. So what you'll see in the picture to the right is you'll see our mist nets that are set up. They're about 30 feet long and about eight feet tall. We kind of do them in a Y pattern. And um, where uh, a research assistant is standing here, there's actually a call box at her feet. Um, and that's where we played the toot, toot, toot to draw the birds in. So then what we do is we go out and we check the nets. This is my supervisor looking, peering, saying, is there an owl? Maybe there is. No, there isn't. This, the people walking behind him, it's like a long parade, is uh, uh, the students. And they say, oh, wait, look, I think there's an owl there. Ah, yes, going under the net. Yep, I'm going to get the owl. Okay. So once we catch that owl, uh, there's a number of different things that we'd want to do. Um, we'd want to measure its wing cord. Uh, we'd want to measure its mass. Those two measurements in particular are really important because that's how you actually tell if it's a male or a female saw web. What's interesting about this, males in general are smaller than females, which kind of follows with the trend when it comes to raptors and other owls. Um, but there is a gray area where it is kind of difficult to tell because when it comes to, unlike birds like cardinals, uh, the owls actually look identical in plumage. There's not really a, a difference there. Um, so you're looking stri strictly at um, what they would call a regression or a, a correlation between the wing cord and the mass. So the higher the wing cord and the greater the mass, the more likely it is that it's a female. Like I said, there is a gray area. There are some owls that I, that we can't sex with 100% certainty, um, especially there's some variation. If it just uh, if it just caught a mouse and it ate it, that's going to impact its weight. Um, so it's, it's not a flawless method. And that's why sometimes it's interesting if our owl is captured somewhere else at another banding station to see if they actually called it the same sex or if the bird was a drastically different mass. And then we also measure its tail length. Now, the one thing you'll notice in the picture is that owl looks pink on the underside. I will say that these owls are not naturally pink on the underside. That is because we're showing uh, or shining in a UV light on it. And the purpose of the UV light is it actually uh, reflects off a molecule in the wing. And this molecule is called porphyrin. So porphyrin is a molecule or a protein that's produced when a new feather is produced. So newer feathers will appear or fluoresce bright pink under UV light. And then you might see a gap off to the right here. These are older feathers. And the reason they're not shining as brightly pink is because over time that porphyrin breaks down and it doesn't reflect that same intensity. So birds, especially owls of the species, do lose their feathers in a very particular method. And so this is the main way that you age them. Most of the birds, as I'll tell you later, um, are going to be in their first year of life. And so all their feathers are fresh, which means their entire wing on the underside is pink, which is really kind of a fun sight. But as years go by, what happens is they replace the feathers just a few at a time. They never replace the whole wing because obviously then they wouldn't be able to fly anywhere um, and defend themselves and hunt and do all those sorts of things. The other thing that happens as they get older is they start to you know, they might have an accident where they have to replace a feather that's kind of unexpected or out of the typical order. So beyond the second or third year, it's actually really difficult to um, age these birds. But for sure, we can tell if it's a hatch year bird, it's first year of life, or um, 
maybe in its second year with, with like 95% reliability. And then what we do is we put a tag on. So um, we have what we call modus tags. Uh, modus tags because they are a particular frequency that can be picked up on these modus towers across the United States and Canada and Mexico. So these specific tags, if a bird flies anywhere near one of these towers, um, that means it will be detected or it will be picked up. So um, we put out typically 20 tags per season, and they typically pulse every 12 to 14 seconds. And they last um, as long as the battery will last, which is typically a little over a year. So what we have, this is just a map of Kennecook County Park. Here's all of our different towers that we have. We have six of them out there. This is what they actually look like. You'll notice that this has six antennas around the top of it. That allows us to get some information about what direction the bird might be from the tower, if it's moving, how far away, not an exact measure of how far away, but if it's distant or if it's close. And then, of course, all the nuts and bolts that go with it, um, solar panels to actually uh, uh, power a battery and make sure it stays up. Um, that was probably one of the most difficult times in securing me as a speaker for this particular talk because this time of year with the lower light levels, I'm frequently going out and trying to switch out batteries and keep those solar panels going. So as I mentioned, these tags, um, they're all the same frequency. So how can you tell one bird's tag from another? Typically, you'll hear like the um, there, there's four little microbursts, and it'll go like da da da, or da da da, and as a result, when those pulses come into the tower, you can actually tell which bird is actually near the tower. From this information, we sometimes can get an idea of um, where the bird might be roosting from one day to the next. Um, it'll tell us if the bird is actually moving. So is it just sitting there most of the time or is it actively foraging throughout the night? What time of day it's moving around? I mean, most of us know that owls are most active um, after the sun goes down, but is all that going, or all that happening at dawn or is it dusk or the middle of the night? Does it not vary? Um, and then also one of the really big questions we're looking at is if these sawwits are coming down to central Illinois, are they just staying there for an hour, a day, a week, two weeks, or are they staying here all winter? And toward that end also, if they are staying here all winter, when are they migrating back north? One way that we can verify uh, the towers, and this has been uh, one of our big difficulties, uh, we found out that even though we spaced our towers out quite uh, in, a, in a quite a large area over the landscape, the owls weren't content just to stay in the area where the towers were, which makes it really difficult to determine if an owl has migrated further south um, or back north, or if it's just on the local landscape. So at the end of the day, despite our best intentions and our best plans, what we end up doing is we end up going out the old fashioned way with handheld antennas and receivers. And we trek across the, the landscape trying to find the owl. And it's an example of an owl you can, might have been able to see it better on one of my other pictures, but here's the antenna off the back of the owl here. So there's a number of different things we've learned so far. Um, one of the big things that we've learned is that sawwood owls in Illinois are not very active. So they're coming down here uh, in the winter and they're just kind of trying to just hold tight, sit in the same spot, try not to be detected, try to just live a quiet, peaceful existence make sure nobody knows that they're there. Um, so, uh, and then of course, when they absolutely have to, they'll risk it and they'll go out and they'll forage and they'll go back to their roost and, and they'll just nibble on their prey for a while. Um, these birds are so small. I was talking about uh, the mice that they eat. Oftentimes they can only eat like half a mouse in a sitting. So oftentimes you'll see them sitting on their roost with half a mouse that they just kind of kind of uh, separated off. Um, and the other thing that we've noticed is there does seem to be a peak um, in activity at dawn and dusk, more so at dusk. So we can infer from that that more likely than not what's going on uh, is they're, they're flying around and they're trying to actually hunt um, and then get back to their roost um, 
for, for the night because one thing they have to worry about as well is there, this is an owl eat owl kind of world. There are owls that are bigger than sawwets that have appetites in the winter. And if they know that there's a sawwet on the landscape and they see it flying around, they very likely could be targeted as prey. We also have learned that most birds that visit central Illinois are female, overwhelmingly so. Um, so we did a pilot season in 2020, and then a season in 2021, 2022, and of course this season. And this season, I think we had 80% females. It was ridiculously high. Um, and uh, most of the birds that visit central Illinois are also very young. So when I say a hatch year bird, I'm talking about a bird that was born in May or June of this year. So uh, you kind of notice that bright magenta, um, so many of these birds are um, hatch year birds. And then you'll notice there are a few other categories there, um, second year birds, after second year, third year. Third year and fourth year is about as precise as you can get with aging. But again, it gets a lot more difficult to actually determine exactly how old they are after their second year. So that's why you'll see that designation as after second year. It could be third year, fourth year, fifth year, ninth year, 10th year. I think the oldest saw wet uh, that's ever been recaptured was somewhere around nine or 10 years old. Um, roost locations vary in location over time. This makes uh, my uh, field technicians, it, it keeps them guessing. Uh, we go out weekly to scan to see what birds might still be on the landscape. And, you know, in a perfect world, I guess in a field tech's perfect world, they'd know that the bird was here. And the next time they'd come out, they'd see that the bird was still there. But the reality is um, this uh, bird here, which is owl 510, like to move around a little bit. Um, owl 470, the orange circles, like to move around even more. Um, and here's another one in these white circles here. Um, we were just uh, tracking a bird yesterday, and uh, we we thought we knew where it would be. We went to Kennecook County Park, head off to where the roost is, no signal. Well, did something happen to the owl? Did it leave? Next thing we know is we're driving around in our tracking Jeep. The bird's actually five miles south of the park. So now we've got to get out, go into Kickapoo State Park, totally different area, and go tromping through the woods, down to the river, over the bluff, and there's the bird all the way down in the thickest patch of honeysuckle you can possibly imagine. So um, it definitely keeps us on our toes. We get our workout this time of year. Um, and there is a lot of satisfaction when you actually do find one of these owls, given the, you know, the trials that you typically have to go to to find them. We've also learned that um, owls begin, as I mentioned, appearing on the landscape in mid-October. Many will continue uh, fall migration to points further south. We had one bird that was detected on a modus tower um, after it was captured by us and a tag was placed. It flew all the way down to the Missouri Ozarks, um, um, not too far southwest of St. Louis. Um, there was another one that we captured and it flew off totally different direction, um, probably about halfway between here and Bloomington, Indiana. Um, so they do vary. Um, we are limited in that there's not as many modus towers in Southern Illinois. As you saw, I do a lot with modus towers. We're working to remedy that for the future to try to get an idea because if there's no towers in Southern Illinois, there's no way for us to actually uh, determine if the owls are passing by or not. But as I mentioned, some birds do overwinter in Central Illinois. So you can see on this graph here, these really long lines, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six of these birds, six of the 20, we know actually kept transmitters on and, and uh, stayed all winter in, um, in Kennecook. Uh, so we were excited. We thought maybe we'd be able to see where these birds would go on their migration north, um, especially since there's a lot of modus towers off to the north and east of where we are located. And I'll get more into that in just a moment. Um, owls also respond to playback, but they tend to do so at dusk or when it's dark outside. Um, I want to talk just a moment about the ethics of playback. When it comes to playback, it's tempting to go outside and say, oh, I want to know if there's a saw wet owl here. I know I'll just play that territorial toot 24-7 and eventually they'll all come into my yard and I'll see them and how wonderful will that be? 
the reality is it's not a very ethical practice, especially um, in the birding community. Um, playback is, is permitted uh, by the average citizen, but beyond just playing it for a short period of time, it's actually highly discouraged, especially for an owl like this that is trying to just stay um, under the radar on its um, winter grounds. For it to be constantly responding to playback, that would cause it to constantly move from its roost, which would make it more detectable to predators, which could definitely impact its survival um, in later life history. But what we have found is birds do tend to respond more to toot calls. We did a short little experiment where we were actually doing banding operations at Allerton uh, Park, where we actually played the different types of calls at the nets. Uh, and then we had just one net where there was silence. And of course, you know, all everybody wanted to go check the net where the toot call was playing because that's where they figured all the sawwits were, were coming in. And for the most part, that was the case. Uh, but I, I went ahead and I drew, you know, the shortest straw at one point. And I decided I would check one of the um, nets on one of the runs that had nothing playing. To my surprise, uh, I found a dead mouse in the uh, net. And uh, as I was just getting ready to walk away from the dead mouse, uh, dead mouse, wondering, you know, why there was a dead mouse in there, um, I looked maybe a foot or two down from the net, and there's a saw wet owl. So probably more likely than not what happened was this owl was just flying through, minding its own business, no territorial toot call to lure it in, but flew right into the net as it was trying to catch a mouse. And there I had both the owl and its dinner. I, I did feel a little guilty about catching its dinner. So when I did release it, you know, I did, did kind of drop the mouse nearby where we released it. I don't know if it came back for it or not. But, um, so we've also learned that um, owls are following interesting migration pathways. Some seem to migrate. So where we're located in um, central Illinois, we're, we're kind of directly due south of uh, Lake Michigan. So uh, Lake Michigan is a pretty big barrier for a bird that's not particularly uh, aerodynamic. It's kind of short, it's got a little stubby tail. Um, you know, it doesn't have uh, some of the same uh, body mechanics of some of these longer distance uh, birds that, that fly uh, really long migration paths, like again, terns and, and thrushes and, and warblers and that sort of thing. Um, so what we found is some seem to migrate along the east shore of Lake Michigan. Some seem to migrate along the west shore of Lake Michigan on their way north or south. Um, but at the same time, too, it seems like some are migrating one path one year and a totally different path another year. So, for example, um, these are foreign owl encounters. So these are birds that were either banded at another station and recaptured in Danville or um, these were birds that were captured in Danville and banded by us and then recaptured by another uh, banding station. So you would kind of expect, you know, points off to the northwest and northeast where, you know, these owls more likely are going from, from Kennecook or to Kennecook. Uh, but then you get just really weird things. So uh, we have had a bird that was um, banded in Pennsylvania and ended up in, in Danville. Um, or conversely, we've actually had a bird that was banded in Danville that was recaptured in Pennsylvania, not terribly far from New York City. Um, did it did it fly directly like this? I guess it's possible, but not likely. More likely what happened was it flew back north to its breeding grounds and then flew back down south uh, towards Pennsylvania. Um, why it decided to go that direction that particular year is anybody's guess. I suppose only the owl knows and Maybe the owl doesn't even know. Maybe it's just the way it went. So when it comes to more refined data, because again, if you have a transmitter on a bird that's picked up by a modus tower, um, it's a lot more, uh, you can oftentimes get a lot higher resolution of the path where it went. And sure enough, that's what we got this past spring. So these were birds that were banded in the fall. And you'll notice uh, this red line here, there was a bird um, that was picked up when it left uh, Danville. And then that same night, it was in Detroit, where it stayed for about a week. And then um, after a week of rest, recovery, or I don't know, maybe it was just enjoying uh, the night on the town, um, it then moved off uh, further into Ontario. Um, and uh, beyond that, uh, we kind of lost it after that. There's not a whole lot of motor stations up beyond here. Um, another bird, um, we, picked, we actually, uh, we didn't, we had a difficult time figuring out where it went in the winter because it just disappeared on the landscape. 
And in the spring, suddenly it uh, it appeared Jasper Pulaski, uh, for those who are familiar with that site in Indiana, uh, decided to fly up somehow, somewhere past Chicago, got picked up at Illinois Beach State Park and went further up uh, the coast or the shoreline um, into Wisconsin. Um, perhaps one of the ones I like to talk about the most is this one here that has a yellow path. Um, we were putting up some MODIS towers in central Michigan here uh, for the purpose of researching Kirtland's warbler. And I said, you know, I'd really, this is a selfish thought, but I'd really like to put those towers up earlier um, so that maybe they might pick up our owl. So, you know, I got a few lab techs to go with me. They were kind of begrudgingly going up here in March when it's a nice balmy 15 degrees Fahrenheit in central Michigan. And we put up our towers and uh, of course, you know, had several trials and whatnot. Uh, drove back and we find out just a couple months later that the owls actually passed our towers the same night that we actually erected the tower. So had we not put those towers up the date and time that we did, we wouldn't have um, we wouldn't have actually captured those detections. I'd like to say that I knew that all along and that's why I timed it the way I did, but uh, I'm not that good. Here's some fall migrations. These are uh, this from this year. This is an owl that we had um, banded last fall. It flew up. We don't know exactly how it got up here. It must have gone in between towers, but um, we did detect on its way back. It crossed Lake Erie um, and it's hanging around in Cleveland right now. Um, and then uh, we have these two birds were actually, this one in purple was uh, banded at Allerton, flew down to uh, South Central uh, Indiana, and this bird at Kennecook, uh, which flew down into the Missouri Ozarks this fall. So how do we like to share our research? Obviously, I'm sharing my research right now, but um, we have a unique situation here at the university where we have a class called NRES 285, Owl Migration. Uh, it's a semester course with 16 undergraduate students, and the students participate in Tuesday owl night banding operations. I'm normally out there Tuesday and Thursdays. And then the students prepare educational outreach materials to present at a public owl night. And so here's the whole crew. Uh, this is the day we caught a barred owl. It's not a saw what I know. That's not what I intended to catch. And after that, we were done with that net. We did do public owl, uh, public owl nights. Um, this is where the students actually then uh, demonstrated their educational outreach skills. We had three this year, one at Kennecook County Park in Vermilion County, one at Homer Lake Forest Preserve in uh, Champaign County, and one at Allerton Park in Pyatt County. It might be hard to tell because of the size of the photo, but here we have a little sawwit owl in Mike Ward's hand. And of course, the public just eating it up in the 21st century, everybody's got to get their cell phone picture, right? So one thing to think about as I kind of close up some of my thoughts here is owl conservation. You know, what, what can we do to help owls on the landscape, um, especially these part-time visitors or part-time residents in, in Illinois? One thing um, that has decreased over the last century um, in Illinois is the whole concept of um, dead, hollow, dead hollow snags and dead trees uh, that provide all these cavities. Now, remember, sawwood owls don't breed in Illinois, for, as far as we know, um, mainly in points north. But these do also provide areas, these cavities, for them to safely uh, overwinter, so places to hide, winter refugia. Also, hedgerows and understory vegetation, as I mentioned, they're, they're taking a, a sawwood owl's worst nightmare in the dead of winter is a nice open understory in a forest. It's got nowhere to hide, nowhere to run. Um, so they really do like these hedgerows, understory vegetation. Not only does it help conceal them, but they're also microclimates that, that tend to um, protect them from the elements. Limiting the use of rodenticides. So um, oftentimes people are not excited about rats and mice uh, uh, in or near their houses. So it's very tempting to put out uh, decon and all types of other um, chemicals that will kill the mice or rats ultimately. Um, the other aspect of that, though, is that owls will oftentimes prey on the easiest prey to catch. So if there is a weakened, sick rat or mouse, it's very likely that it will eat that. And in consuming that, it will also consume the rodenticide. And as a result, it can weaken or kill the owl. So being aware of that, and then finally, since we are talking about a migratory owl, 
trying to limit light pollution. A lot of cities um, have started to become more aware of this. Um, and so they do have lights out nights uh, where they minimize the amount of light that's actually being generated because not all lights that we have on during the night need to be on. If you're wondering what the, what the significance of that is, if we have a lot of light um, pointing up at the sky. You've got birds that are trying to migrate and navigate south. Oftentimes what studies have found is they become disoriented. And as a result, as they become disoriented, they'll kind of get into a holding pattern and then eventually just die from exhaustion, um, not being able to find where they need to go. Because um, it is a very delicate energetic balance for a bird as it's migrating south. They need to be able to put on enough weight and fat reserves to get them to where they need to go. Um, and so getting lost along the way does not help toward that goal. And now that you think you saw it all, um, I'll open the uh, room for questions. And I've got my email there if there's any other follow-up questions. That's a good one, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> saw it all. Okay, we do have a few questions that came through on chat, Mike, and I will try my best here. Uh, okay. First question was, um, how did they get the name Sawet? Yeah, that's a really good question. It has a lot to do with the name, uh, with the sound that they produce. So if you look at the spelling, it's like wetting a saw. So like you're trying to sharpen a saw. And, and back in the old days when they would do that, that would make a very distinct sound that's actually similar to one of the calls that they make. Hello. My name is Kat Purcell. I'm the career librarian here at the Champaign Public Library. I also, in my free time, enjoy working with ancestry programs. I love to do my own research on my own personal family, and I also like to research old homes. I'm going to walk you through the intro to ancestry program today so that you can use your library, the Champaign Public Library, to access ancestry.com and figure out how to find out about your own family history. Give me just a moment. I'm going to pop open our presentation here. So here we see um, the beginning of the Champaign Public Library's program on introduction to ancestry.com. I am once again, Kat Purcell. You can reach me at uh, the email address or the phone number display here. Uh, if you have any questions about this webinar, or uh, if you wanted to schedule a book a librarian appointment to help you get started on diving into ancestry.com on your own. Well, the first thing we're going to talk about today is the Ancestry Library Edition versus the commercial account. Um, so there's two ways you can access Ancestry.com. You can come into the Champaign Public Library and access it through our computers, which gives you free access to everything. But you do have to be physically located in the Champaign Public Library, whether on one of our computers or your own device. Or you can access it from home by creating a commercial account and uh, subscribing to the Ancestry.com access. Mm -hmm. But we're also going to talk about how to create your own free login that you can access from home to create your own personal um, Ancestry tree. We're also going to discuss how to access the site from the library and how to navigate the site. And then we're going to get into creating your own account and creating a family tree. So first, let's talk about the differences between the Ancestry Library Edition and a commercial account. So if you're accessing Ancestry Library um, from the library account, you're going to need to be physically in the library. You can do this on one of our own computers, or like I mentioned just a little bit ago, you can bring in your own laptop or your own iPad. And as long as you're physically in the building connected to the library's Wi-Fi, you can also still have access to Ancestry.com and their research documents. It includes international records. So if you are trying to track down ancestors that were located overseas, you can still access those records. There is no DNA content though, so if you wanted to do a DNA analysis of your own ancestry research, you would need to create a commercial account for that. Uh, but you do still have access to family trees and you can see message boards, but you cannot respond to them or comment. A commercial account will give you access to a paid subscription. You can access it anywhere at the library or at home or on vacation in France. Um, and it does include international records, but it is an extra subscription fee based uh, in addition to the basic cost. DNA content is extra. Um, you can either create a free account and submit your DNA account, uh, your DNA analysis through your own free account, or you can pay 
additional content um, once you've submitted your DNA for further things. And we won't get into that here at the library because that's a whole other can of worms. Um, but uh, you also have access to all the family trees ability to build out and you can access message boards with your own account and reply to them to connect to other folks. Why use Ancestry.com? It's a great way to know your family story. Maybe you've got some family um, lore that has made it down through the generations and you want to find out whether it's true or not. Um, it's a great way to build family connections. I've found second cousins and my own grandpa through Ancestry.com. Um, and it's also a good way to establish some medical and geographical knowledge and where your family is from as well. So now we're going to go into a bit of a demonstration on how to access the site. So give me just a moment as I switch screens. All right, so we're going to start at champagne.org. If you are in the library and want to access our Ancestry account, I recommend starting at the e-library. From there, you're going to go to online tools. Sometimes the online tools we advertise down here change, so I always recommend clicking directly on online tools here. And then right at the top, because we do it in alphabetical order, you'll see in library use. That's going to open up the access to Ancestry.com. Well, that's how to access Ancestry.com from the library. You could do it this way at home too, but if you're not paying for your own subscription, then you will not be able to do any researching from the documents. You can see the documents, but you will not be able to click to them or download them or view more. So now that we've accessed Ancestry libraries through the Champaign Public Library's access, I'm gonna go over just the homepage here. This main homepage here sometimes changes based on what they're advertising at the time. Uh, you can search from this button here, find your stories, but I'm going to go over the main ribbon at the top here. This right hand corner indicates that you're logging in through Champaign Public Library and not your own account. Going back from the left hand side, we've got the home screen here. We've got the search. That's going to take you to a page on how to search specific things, which that's the bulk of what we'll be getting into today and how to use the search. So we'll come back to that. You can see the message boards. This is a great place um, to research particular ancestors that you're having a hard time finding documents on. One of the reasons that I first started getting into that is that there was some big um, stories in my family about my ancestor, Robert Mitchell, who had come over from Scotland and had had um, great success in the battlefield over there back in the days. And he had his own tartan and everything. And Robert Mitchell does exist. In fact, multiple Robert Mitchells exist. But my ancestor was supposedly connected through him by Enos Mitchell. So he's a big one that we're stuck on. And so if we search Enos Mitchell, we can see lots of message results for other people talking about him and trying to find that connection here. Um, this is him in particular. So we could look here and we could find out what these other people have talked about in terms of my ancestor, Enos Mitchell, and whether he connects or not to Robert Mitchell from Scotland. Going back to the homepage, we can also look at the Learning Center. This is also a great place to get started once you dive in. And if you're not really sure where to start, you can go from here. Um, here's a good tutorial page on getting started with your own family research. There's some top 10 search tips, creating timelines that produce answers, and Ancestry DNA 101, the insider's guide. My biggest advice with Ancestry.com is it's really easy to get stuck in a rabbit hole and then go in down the different paths that you didn't even see coming and researching your family. Um, so my, my biggest recommendation is before you get started on Ancestry.com is come in with a goal for that day. Maybe it's a goal to figure out a census record date. Maybe it's a goal on a specific ancestor that you're trying to find out. Um, but come in with one specific question and try that out. And then once you find the answer, feel free to open up yourself to any rabbit holes you want to go down on. The next research aid that um, is going on here is the census list. It gives you some 10, 10 census tips. Those are usually the biggest um, documents that people use to back up their ancestry research because it gives you the time and place, but also often a career or an income, the house number, a location, as well as their neighbors um, or each of your ancestors' history. Uh, so then there's some more guides to that. 
And then there's beyond the basics. So the next place people usually go to research their ancestors are religious records, um, death records, military favorites, cemetery research, um, and black sheep people. Because if you have ancestors like I do in your family who had either criminal records or were in asylums, you can use those records to track them down as well. There's also a good part of figuring out the immigration of your ancestors, where how to track that immigrant information down, military records, and then ethnic. If you're researching African-American, German or Canadian or Swedish family members, here's some guides to get you started on those, because those are really big sticking points on a lot of folks' families. The next thing on navigating their website to get to, that is the Learning Center. You'll see here the Learning Center um, is what we just talked about. I'm mean, sorry, the charts and forms is the next big tool. Um, so you can research uh, your family a couple of different ways. A lot of folks like to research it physically by having a form in front of your hand to write down while you look up digital records. Um, but I like to do both. So I have digital records and I'll show you how I often have um, Ancestry in one tab and my own in another um, here shortly. But these are some good ones to print out too. As a librarian, I really like to have backed up data. So I have both physical printed ancestry charts for mine, which you can create here and download and fill it in digitally or print it out and then type it in as well. Um, but there's also a research calendar. So if you're creating a schedule of events or I'm going to go to this place then to research the specific year, what did I find out? That can help you keep track of it. Another really good tool is a research extract. So this is a good example of um, how you figured out information and what your objective was or your time period spent. Another really good one is a correspondence record. So if you're reaching out to people and connecting on message boards, this is a great way to keep track of who you're researching, the date you sent the information to them, how you emailed them and what your goal was for finding out about them um, and whether they replied to you or not or what the results of what you found out was. So I found some emails of my grandpa that he had sent through other people on um, ancestry.com and found out some good lore about my family history just from accidentally stumbling across posts of emails that my grandpa had sent to somebody else when I was tracing that ancestor down to. My biggest um, tool that I use is the family group sheet. It can get overwhelming on keeping track of which ancestors you're looking at when. So I have something like this for each ancestor I'm tracking in my family, um, which goes from a family group record. So it will keep track of a family and then you can start by the spouse, their occupation, their relationship to you, their address or your ancestor address, um, when they were born, born married, um, Kristen died or buried their father and mother and then their spouse and then it goes into their children's and then you can correspond that number one children to maybe the title of this page for each person that you go on from there. When you're building out your family group record, I always recommend starting backwards. So when I first started doing ancestry research, I started with myself. And then I worked to my parents and my grandparents and so forth and so on. And the reason that that happens is because you want to establish those connections backwards in time. It's really easy when you're looking through family lore to try and be tempted to start with Enos Mitchell. But if we're looking for the connection between Enos Mitchell and his supposed father, Robert Mitchell, who came directly from Scotland, it's easy to try and want to invent those records if they don't exist. So it's really important to make sure you're working backwards. So you're just going with the established facts until you get to that ancestor that you're really trying to find out about. The next one would be a source summary, which if you're familiar with any kind of academic writing, this is kind of like a bibliography for your, your ancestors. It's going to give you information about your ancestor, their spouse, their lineage chart, their number, if you want to assign them, and any information about them that you found and where you found them from. So that's the big tool of charts and forms. It's a really great place to start. And then they always like to highlight new collections. Um, there's always ancestry records added all the time to the card catalog in ancestry.com. The biggest one that most people are talking about lately is the 1950 census records just opened up, I think last year. Um, but anytime they're adding to new collections, they're gonna go here. And that might be a great place to start if you're trying to get back into that one ancestor you're stuck on finding information for. So that is back to um, from the website. I'm going to go back to sharing my presentation here. We'll want to have a couple of things to start with. First of all, it is a um, 
it is a site. So you'll, you'll need to be prepared to create your own personal account. Um, you do not have to pay for it. Ancestry makes it really difficult to try and find um, where you can log in that doesn't require payment, but it does exist. And I'll walk you through that next, but be prepared. You will need to put in your actual name and email to connect it to and an individual password for creating that account. So now that we've gone over the information you'll need, we will go into how to create your own account. So I'm going to pop my screen back up again. And in this form, we will have, um, I'm going to have the Ancestry Library. I'm going to close out of these tabs and I'm going to open up Ancestry.com and show you how I have my setup when I do research. So I have the library access here. And in this tab, I'm going to log into my own Ancestry account, which you see here. Now, this starts with me, like I said, and then my parents. If I do a search here, let's say I'm looking for my ancestor, Anos Mitchell. I can search in the screen, even though I'm at the library, but you'll see some of this information is grayed out. And if I go to click on viewing it, it just prompts me to pay for it. So that's frustrating. But if we keep our search for Enos Mitchell up here, and I'm going to find him in my tree, we can change how to view him. But I'm going to start with what he looks like in my ancestor chart. So we see that he was born in 1816. So if we bounce back to the tab where we're searching through the library account, and you'll see here in the corner it says Champagne as opposed to my profile picture. We can type in Enos Mitchell and 1816. And if we hit search, we're going to get similar results. But now if we want to take a look at that census, we can click view and we can see it. Now we can see the information about my ancestor, Enos Mitchell. The cool thing about Ancestry is that it is also going to show us this information. But if we go back, we can click on this title here and it's or hover over it and it's going to show us a transcribed version of what um, the chart itself says which sometimes is helpful because the handwriting of the folks doing the recording of this information isn't always easy to read so here's another example of enos mitchell and how we can hover over it this is the 1850 census and we can see the information he was male he was white he was 34 he was born in 1816 in virginia his home in 1850 was in ohio and his occupation was a minor and um, we see that his spouse was supposedly harriet and his child was george but it also lists a further household members charles george harriet major and so forth but if we click on that we can see a detailed version of the actual census record itself. Now, the census record itself didn't track a lot of information, but it took the name, the occupation, how old they were, where they were born, and if they were deaf or blind or any other things. We also can see their neighbors. We see that John Thompson was the neighbor on the next street. And on the other side of that door was Henry Skinner and their children. This is helpful because sometimes a lot of neighbors marry each other and are friends with each other. So you might recognize some of these names further on down your list in your ancestry records. So now that you're familiar with how to do a research history, um, I'm going to show you how to save that information. So let's say this is information that we really want access to and we want to save it for later. So we don't always have to be physically present at the library to access this information. You can print this document, which would send it directly to the library's printers. You can send this document directly to your email and then it will send you a PDF, which you can then download or save however you want, print from your own computer. But my biggest tool is going ahead and clicking on the document and up in the corner, you'll see save to this computer. 
and I'll walk you through that process. So now it's downloaded it, but it's given it a random number assignment here. So I'm going to open that just so I can rename it. And I'm going to rename it. I don't know if it will show you that the way I've got it set up now, but I'm going to name it to 1850 census. And then I always like to put in um, who it is that is of interest to me from that census record. So this time it's Enos Mitchell. Now I'm going to show you how I can save that to my own file. So if I have a USB drive plugged in, I could save it there. Um, if I have my own chart, I could also save it there. So I'm going to go to, back to my profile page where I've logged in. And I'm going to open up my um, relative, Enos Mitchell, and his page. So if you click on his profile, we're going to go back to his exact page. And this is a record of all of the information uh, that I've collected on him so far. So I've got his birth, his death. Um, I've got any relatives, his father his marriage here, and any of his children lined up. It can be helpful to list all your children that have been had in that ancestry, even if they're your great, 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 great uncle, um, because you could track them um, and figure out um, other connections, maybe through those siblings um, information. So now that I found this 1850 thing, I like to store all my documents in the gallery, and then I like to add them as a source later. So there's lots of information of other sources that line out to things that I found. As I established, um, we don't really know that Enos Mitchell is a direct descendant of Robert Mitchell. I have that connected here, but I haven't found proof that the Robert Mitchell from Scotland is actually my ancestor, Enos Mitchell's father. So that's the reason why I have all those other links and conversation debated. But here we've got a gallery and I can add media. So if I have a photo, I can add that here and then I could change it. I currently have his photo set to be as gravestone, um, but there is a photo of his family here. We also already have a record here of the 1850 census record. Um, and so this has already been uploaded and I've linked it to the other relatives that are mentioned in it in case I need to sort them later. You can also see that other users have saved that information to their own family history. One thing I think that's important to be aware of on Ancestry.com is um, anybody can add anything that they want to Ancestry.com and it's not necessarily a verifiable source. So be careful when you're linking the documents that other people have uploaded about your connected ancestor to your own family tree. And just be aware that it might not be accurate. So just take the time to look over it before you connect it to your own tree. So before we go back to my presentation, I wanted to go over the ways that you can set up your family tree. You can make as many family trees as you want. You can create and manage trees here. When I was first getting into this myself, um, my, both my grandfathers on my mom and my dad's side had done a lot of family searching. So I had created my own tree that I was using to verify information on. And I had my own parent, grandparents tree separate from that. Um, so I could verify what they had done and then find the documents to prove what they had done correct and share it to my actual tree. Um, so you can create a tree. You can create as many trees as you want. Um, this is the current tree that I have going on. And you can change how it's viewed. Currently, I have this set up as a fan chart, which can be kind of helpful. You can set um, your person, your start person. So now I've got it back to me. And you can see there's me in the middle. And then both my parents and then their families. And this can be helpful to um, show those different uh, avenues of uh, possible exploration. But you can also change it to what a lot of people are more used to seeing, which is a vertical tree. Um, and here it's going to give you a little guide. Uh, now we can see little profile pictures I've shown me, my spouse, and then their parents, my parents and their siblings. If I click on my dad, it will show um, his siblings extended out this way. Um, and now it branches out further and further and further as we go back through the generations. Um, I also like to toggle between these charts if I'm using those sibling connections to try and find more connections. Um, so that's a good way to do that. You can also change it to do horizontal search. I think this is also a handy view to use in different settings. So you can figure out which branch to start from. As you've seen, I've gone pretty far back in a lot of my family trees. I think the furthest I've got back is maybe the 13th generation. 
back from me. Some of this information is not verified yet, which is why it's green. Um, belief is a little hint. Um, that's where it's going to be half if you're wanting to explore those hints that ancestry is constantly going to be throwing at you. It's helpful to pop that up and then in the other window have your ancestry library access available because if you explore those hints you're not going to be able to view that information but it's still really important so you can grab the information here type in their name and their birth date here and then find the document and then be able to actually view it and save it so that's a good way to change uh, search as well now that i've gone through different ways to set it up i'm going to pop back into my presentation and we'll take a look at some specific things to be aware of while you're doing your research. So now that you've created your own tree and you've shaped it out, um, you can see how to start your tree, how to pick a person to go with, whether you want to look at a pedigree, descendant, family group, or fan chart, um, and then how to view the pedigree view or the family view or the fan chart. Um, next, we're going to get into some search tips. So I'm going to briefly go over census records. Um, we have uh, countless access to census records, both federal, state, and international census records through Ancestry Library Edition. As you saw, we looked at um, the English uh, census record of 1841 for one of my ancestors, and they all are structured differently based on the information that the government was wanting to gather at that time. So here we see an example of um, an 1890 uh, census record on the right and then on the left an 1880 census record and this both has very different categories of nations. you can see that pretty much all of them will gather the first and last name and then age and then the gender or race uh, but after that it really changes so most commonly you will see the occupation and sometimes you'll find out also about how much education they had or um, their parents were where their parents were from whether they were sp speaking English natively or not um, and then sometimes you'll also see um, some salary information or education information so here's another thing to be aware of while searching uh, names are not always spelled the same in the census records here's an example of my ancestor Peter Van Newport uh, we see that in one of the census records, it was spelled P Van N I E W P O R T. Uh, but we also see in the previous one, it was Van um, N I E W U P O O T. So those are different names. Um, and then later, in, they ended up anglicizing their name even more. Um, his daughter then listed her name as just Newport as her last name in the next census. So the names can change throughout years, and sometimes that's due to literacy of the person being identified. Some of that is due to the census taker and what they were writing down. Um, spellings might not always have been accurate, particularly if the ancestor was not literate. Um, and sometimes it's they're changing their name because they're wanting to reintegrate more into American culture, like my ancestor Newport, um, who dropped off the van in front of their name eventually. Um, I also have one branch of my family, that one in particular, who came from uh, Holland. Uh, they uh, were originally Jewish, and uh, previous to Peter Van Newport, their first names were all more like Samuel, Lemuel, <laughs> Hannah, um, and Shabael. And then suddenly they come to America, and we've got a bunch of Peters, um, Birdies, Evas, and a lot of others. So um, a lot of that time is just changing the name to fit into the culture and their surroundings more. Um, so one thing to note while you're searching for um, your ancestors is you can use lots of different tools on Ancestry to change how you're searching. So for example, uh, if you have an ancestor named Samuel, you might use um, a Sam, S-A-M, and then a star, so shift eight on the keyboard. And that is going to bring up any people who share that name, but could fall under Samuel, Sammy, or Samantha on census records. Um, another option is to use a question mark as a possibility. So if you have the last name Anderson, and you're not sure if their name is going to come up spelled Anderson with an E or an O, you can type it out A-N-D-E-R-S question mark N. And then that's going to get you any results with that last name Anderson, which is S-O-N or S-E-N. And that can help you figure out more about that person. Uh, by capturing all of those ways that Anderson could have been spelled. 
Another thing to be aware of is, um, like I said, name spellings are expected. I have an ancestor named Phoebe, and across four different census records, Phoebe has been spelled four different ways. So in one version, it's F-E-E-B-Y, and another, it's F E. B E and another it's P H E B E and then in a third or fourth it's spelled P H O E B E. So just be aware name spellings and misspellings are very common. Who knows what it actually was? I suspect Phoebe herself was probably not able to read, so who knows? Uh, her best guess was as good as ours. Uh, but knowing that her name could be spelled different ways is a good way to open up yourself to possible records if you're stuck on an ancestor. So here's another example of a census record. This is the 1921. It's just going to show you some few examples. Um, like I said, sometimes this handwriting can be tricky to read. On Ancestry.com, you can zoom in and zoom out. And if you hover over it, it is going to show you some examples um, of, of how they transcribed their name. On this sheet, my ancestor is Ari Sharp, and we see his wife, Eva, and their daughters, Bernice and Agnes. We can see that Ari was a head with a wife and two daughters. And we can see their ages. We can also see where they were from, where he was born, um, and where their parents were from. And then it also lists their occupation, nun, farmer, and then how much they might have made. Here's another example. The 1950s, like I said, were just released. They're a lot of fun to sort through because every fifth line here has additional questions that were asked and you can follow up down here and sometimes they were children sometimes they're adults but they also collected in that year education level as well as salary information so next we're going to get into a brief overview of search tips for vital records you can also use ancestry.com to search through marriage death birth and military records um, here are some examples of those. So we're going to pick on Ari Sharp again. This is his um, certificate of birth. In rural areas, the certificate of birth did not always happen when they were born. Sometimes um, we didn't record, they did not record that birth until they were next able to get into town. It could have been months or years after their child was born. Um, in some cases, even today, we run into that in the United States. Uh, a lot of Amish are not always recorded in a hospital as a birth, so they don't get a birth certificate at all sometimes, sometimes not until years later. Here's another example of a certificate of marriage. This is the Iowa State Department of Health. So it lists out um, who was getting married, in this case, Dale Reynolds and his wife, where he was getting married, and that both of their parents, Ari Scharf, um, and so forth. And then um, it gives them the actual... Um, certificate in marriage down at the bottom. Next is an example of a death certificate. As I was talking about earlier, Ancestry.com lists out the information of uh, like digitally what was on that document in case it's hard to read. But here we can see that this death certificate was um, put in with typewriter so you can read it pretty clearly. Um, it also gives not just a name of who uh, was married to them, but also their parents. We see James Carpenter and Emma Carpenter there is listed the parents, but we also get a cause of death, which can be really helpful to figuring out medical information about your family history. Here's an example of a registration draft card. This is for my aunt's, my great grandpa. Um, and it gives information about when he was born. It also gives some information about which war it was for. And this can also be interesting, not just because it's a military record that's important, but also lists his physical description. So on the back of the card, we also see his height, um, which was listed as medium, his build was medium, but we also see that he had brown eyes and brown hair. And that can be fun just to touch into what that ancestor would have looked like if you don't get to know them. Next, we're going to briefly go over civil records. These are an added depth of records to explore. You can often use Ancestry to find immigration, city directories, school and church documents, if they had um, any kind of uh, religious registration. Maybe they went through confirmation or had uh, a um, baptism that might show up through Ancestry records. 
Um, it also lists immigration records. So this is not just an immigration record, but it lists as who they were employed as as a vessel crew member. Um, so here we see not only um, that my ancestor was listed on this particular boat at this particular year, but we also see that he served as a crew member. Um, and we can see what position he had, uh, where he started from on his voyage and where he left to. Here's another example of a naturalization record. Um, these are also great tools to see. Um, we can find out that my ancestor Ari Scharf down there at the bottom corner was a native of Holland and he um, gave up his uh, citizenship to Holland to become United States citizen. So here's some other basic search tips. Um, it's always important to try and have at least two of these three categories. If you have all of them, great. Um, but it's helpful to have their first and last name. I know not always do we, do we have access to um, uh, spouses' last names. Sometimes they can't find records of what your um, ancestor's wife's maiden name was. That can make it tricky, but hopefully we can at least know where they were born, where they might have lived, and then the birth year, and that can help narrow down those records. Like I said, it's also important to be aware of spellings. Here's once again that example of my ancestor Phoebe, um, the different ways that her name has been spelled, um, and uh, that can help with it. There's also a vast amount of other ancestry-related access sites that you can use, and that could be a whole different series to get into. But you can always find documents, whether you are subscribed or at the library or not, on the National Archives, the Library of Congress, Ellis Island and Urban foundation information. Um, those have all kinds of immigration records and you don't have to have any kind of login at all to find those records. Um, some other sites that do require some logins but are free are MyHeritage and FamilySearch. Both of those have subscription access levels, uh, but it is also free to create an account and build out your family tree on those. That being said, if you have any questions, um, here on YouTube is not the best place for them, but you can always call or email the library. You can call us at 217-403-2000, or you can send an email to librarian at champagne.org, or you can reach out to me, cpurcell at champagne.org. Thank you so much for your time today. I really hope you enjoyed the presentation. Take care. Thank you for tuning into CUI's TV. We hope you enjoyed the show. This video can be accessed anytime on youtube.com. In the YouTube search bar, type in UPTV6 and look for their microphone logo. We hope you will join us again next week for more local, engaging content designed specifically for Champaign County older adults. Take care and stay safe.